session. Uh, I hope everybody is back here and can hear me loud and clear. So our next session is a workshop and it will be led by Ereshni Naidu Silverman who moderated the session with Alessandra Cummins this morning, my colleague. So it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce Eresh. Eresh, I'm gonna read your bio again for those who maybe were not here in the morning. Uh, so just give me one second. Ereshni Naidu Silverman is the Senior Director for the Global Transitional Justice Initiative, the coalition's flagship program on transitional justice. Ereshni holds over 20 years experience designing and implementing community outreach strategies and programs in critical post-conflict settings that include South Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Sri Lanka, and Colombia, among many others. She is a seasoned educator with extensive curriculum and workshop design experience and has broad content development training and facilitation skills. A thought leader and global transitional justice practitioner, Ereshni pioneered the coalition's work in transitional justice in 2014 and now leads the Global Initiative for Justice, Truth and Reconciliation, which under her stewardship manages 58 projects in 17 countries engaging 256 local civil society organizations in Colombia, Guinea, Sri Lanka, and the Middle East and North Africa region, among other locales. Ereshni earned her Bachelor of Arts and two Masters of Arts degrees from the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa, the first in Dramatic Arts in 98, and the second in Forced Migration Studies in 2004. She subsequently earned her PhD in Sociology from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Resh, the floor is yours. Thanks, JJ. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm excited to be here facilitating this workshop. Um, and I think it's going to be more about questions that I'm going to pose to you all, because all of you have the information uh, within yourselves. Uh, so I think just to start off, some of you have been here on and off uh, during the week. I see lots of familiar names and, well, I don't see faces, but names. So I'm excited to see you all again. Uh, and some of you have been here during the morning. So just to begin, uh, maybe you can describe in the chat box how you're feeling after you've heard some of the sessions, after you've participated in some of these discussions. Uh, you can start chatting in the box, whether you feel energized, light, angry, Ready for action? Sad? Any thoughts, anyone? No? Okay, I'll tell you how I'm feeling. Uh, I was both angry and sad because I think, and, and also uh, inspired. I think I was angry because uh, this has gone on for so long. Racism is so endemic. Um, I was sad that so many people have suffered through it. Um, but I'm inspired to listening to people and listening to lots of the work you're doing about ways to take action. Okay. Nabodsa, I hope I'm saying your name right. Please, if you want to correct me, Turn on the mic and you can. You are feeling encouraged. Anybody else? Kaioro uh, motivated. Liz resolute. Okay. Uh, sense of urgency. Uh, Marta, uh, JJ, do you want to read yeah. uh, translate that for me? Yes. Uh, I, I feel hope that we are many, uh, many men, many uh, men and women in different territories that fight together for a world in which we respect and uh, safeguard human rights. Okay. 
Okay, thanks for it to everybody for participating in that. So uh, just to begin, I think I'm gonna, there's lots of, I, I wanna preface this by saying there's lots of jargon right now going around about races, what racism means, what's prejudice, what's discrimination. Uh, many of you may want to know what a, an anti-racist, I had to look it up and read about it a little bit more. Um, and um, and so, and Shirley says she's thinking about how anti-racism can be taught in workshops and schools. Uh, so I think with lots of the work that we're doing, lot, it starts with ourselves. Um, and I wanna start off by doing a little exercise uh, and then we can go into a discussion about um, definitions as well as um, a, a more of a conversation. So Danny said, I feel, he, I feel informed. What I grew up seeing as normal is being proven otherwise. Plantation workers, mistreatment, poor pay and terrible housing, this and more. And these are saddening issues. Abdullah, uh, I feel angry about this unlimited world. OK, so just to start off this exercise, make sure you're sitting comfortably. We're going to deal with a little bit of un discomfort for now. So make sure you're sitting comfortably, your sit bones, those two bones on your buttocks, uh, on your chair, and your feet are on the ground and head raised high. Um, and, and just take in a deep breath, because as I said, we're gonna, we're gonna, if we, if we wanna do this exercise, honestly, we're gonna have to sit with some discomfort. Okay. And you're gonna need a piece of paper and pen. And I, I have a few questions for you and you're not gonna share these. I'm not gonna ask you to share it. So it's just for yourself. And while you're answering these questions, also think about uh, what sensations in your body are starting to arise, whether you, as I said, feeling angry, feeling sad, is there a pain in a certain part of your body? And the reason why I'm saying this is because more and more they're starting to, there's literature coming out, is that um, how we relate to our bodies and how our bodies behave in the world is related to how we are situated in the world. So through oppression, uh, such as colonization, ancestral trauma of slavery. Uh, we've, there's changes in our bodies, uh, the, the postures, the way, we, the way we walk in the world. I know, for example, I still do it now unconsciously, is as a, per, a brown person, I, I always, for example, don't uh, open my handbag while I'm in the store because I, I know that people pay more attention to me than a white bodied person. Uh, and, and I could be, somebody could call upon me to look into my bag, for example, that kind of thing. So we embody, we have racialized bodies. And as I said, our bodies react to how we've been racialized. So we've often seen this and people can share their experiences after this exercise. For example, prisoners or survivors of torture, uh, their postures and their bodies change in certain ways. They kind of close down a little bit. Um, and, uh, and it's because of the, the experience that they've had. Okay, so pay attention to the body as well. So my first question to you is, think of a time when you were in a powerful position How did it feel? And did you want to share that power? I'll give you about two minutes for each of these questions.
my next question is now think of a time when you felt a deep prejudice against someone. How did you act? How did you feel? Did that person who you were being prejudiced against know? Okay, next question. Think of a time when somebody discriminated against you. And how did you feel and what did you do? And now finally, think about a time when you saw something wrong that was being done to somebody else. For example, a server was being treated badly. And how did you react to that wrong? How did your reaction make you feel? And how did you, how did the other person who you were almost trying to speak on their behalf or protect them, how did that person feel? I'll give you two minutes to wrap up. Okay, hey, so some of you did not get, I think, the last two questions. I'm going to repeat it. Think of a time when somebody discriminated against you. How did you feel during that time? And the last question was, Think of a time when something, when you saw a wrong being done to somebody else. How did that make you feel? How did you react? And how did it make the other parties feel?
Okay, can we all come back? So I said I wasn't going to ask you to share, uh, but if everybody can please share in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Let's just do it uh, popcorn style if you want to. Um, if you unmute yourself and or, or you can post in the chat, tell me, just give me words that that you use that describes the situation um, that described the situation when you were in power, any kind of adject adjectives that that you used. So a time when you were in power, a powerful position. Anybody want to share? Happiness, fireworks, empowering, daunting, huge responsibility. Untouchable, yes. Bossy, humbled. Okay. Those are good words. Appreciated and recognized on the spotlight. Responsibility. JJ, can you please translate Rosario's comment? Um, it says, in general, I always intervene in the situations that I consider unjust. Okay, thanks, Rosario. Okay, so let's go to the second question. Now think of a, a, the time when you felt a deep prejudice against somebody. How did that feel? And also just to say, um, we all have prejudice and it's because it's, we socialize to be prejudiced as human beings. So it's nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, but what we, I think the work that we need to do, and I try to do this regularly, I'm still working on it, is to try to understand where those prejudice are, prejudices are coming from and find ways to overcome it and be very cognizant of when they come up. Empowering. Now, when I feel prejudiced, I feel very ashamed. Surely ashamed. Succumb frustrated. JJ, loss of dignity. Angry, but I may act, feel, think prejudice against someone unconsciously. Yes. Okay, let's go to the third question. How did you feel descriptions of how did you feel when somebody discriminated against you? And this may still be happening. It may be happening on a regular basis. Up in arms. Depends on the nature of the person. If he's afraid, I feel ashamed. And if he has been satisfied. Funny. Hurt and angry. Hated. Misunderstood. Worried. I was thinking about the bigger picture. Okay, thank you everybody. And now for our last question, uh, a time when you saw a wrong and when you acted, uh, how did that make you feel? 
Uh, Rosario, do you want to share with us since you said you do it quite, you do it often when you feel a see a wrong? How how does it make you feel when you confront somebody who's doing wrong? Mostly angry and confrontational, yes. Bueno, un nivel de indignación por las cosas. I feel I feel indignation for the things that I feel that are unjust. And and I just have to get involved sometimes when I shouldn't. And, but happily, I have found positive outcomes. Although I, I feel indignation, I do try to remain calm and, and try to reason my way uh, through it so I can be heard. Okay, thank you, Rosario, for sharing outraged missionary okay so i wanted to share this exercise with you because we've all had feelings of discrimination we've all been prejudiced in some way uh, and these are all the feelings that are going around in the world and as people trying to address uh, questions of racism uh, discrimination, and we're doing it daily in our works, in our, in our work, in our personal life. Uh, these are all the emotions that we constantly need to manage and address. Um, so I hope that was useful for, for you. Uh, and I also wanted, wanted to share it because I think we as individuals, as I said, have these experiences and it's helpful to bring these experiences to our work so that we are able to both empathize and sympathize with the different groups that we work with. Uh, okay, does anybody have any questions about that exercise? I have a question. Okay, uh, who am I? I can't see the screen, sorry. So please tell me who's speaking and then go ahead. Uh, it's Nebuchadnezzar from Belgrade. Okay. From uh, Cultural Center Expand 92. Uh, I wonder which power we are talking about. When we say power, which power is it? I think it is can be any power because uh, we, we, have, we have different power relations in different spaces. We have power relations in the workspace. Uh, we have power relations in our home space. Um, in in the community with the communities with who we work uh but i'm not sure did you think about any other power relation uh that that, that is, is that why you're asking about the the question well i'm an active anti-fascist movement here which is pretty much uh, uh connected to anti-racist politics and theory so there is power of anti-fascist movement and there is also power of fascist movement so when we say power, I mean, this, these are just extremes. There is variety of different powers and power relations within the two extremes, between the two extremes. So when we say power, it's like unclear which power, power of resistance or power of exploitation, let's say. It, it's power of multiple things. I think when I asked you to do the, the exercise about of time when you felt powerful, part of it is to uh, exemplify, for example, how colonizers or people who are, for example, white supremacists or feel when they have that power and when there's a society that's backing them up. Uh, and, and so it's also when we have power, what do we do when we have power as individuals? Uh, do we use it for good? Do we abuse it? Do we want to share it? Uh, and 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 it's a complex it's it's a complex um, web of different types of power that we're constantly negotiating. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody any uh, anybody else has any any contributions to the question. Feel free to unmute yourself and uh, just. Say your name and you can contribute um can i can i speak yes surely thank you um you know since i've never had state uh, power i've never felt it 
So I, I saw it really from a grassroots perspective or a civil society perspective. And even for example, being a moderator, um, one has power. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said humbled. Okay, yeah, I agree. Uh, anybody else? Okay, so if you have any other thoughts that come up while I'm doing the presentation, feel free to, to note it and we can talk about it. We have a session where we're gonna do a group, a larger group reflection at the end. Uh, so you can either save your questions, put it in the chat and we'll keep note of it. Uh, Camilla, thank you for uh, transitioning my slides. Can you please go to the next slide? So as I said, um, there's lots of definitions out there in the field that have always been evolving. And lots of these are very academic definitions. So, in, and as I said, we all have understandings of these things uh, from our own knowledge, from our own work and our own experiences. Uh, but, so I'm not a big fan of elaborate uh, definitions, but I think it's very useful to understand it so that we are able to uh, work, understand the framework through which we're working. So the first definition, and this, uh, this is actually a presentation that two of my co colleagues, uh, Anita and Ella did for us during a staff meeting. Um, and the first definition is of prejudice. And prejudice is prejudgment about another person based on the social groups to which they belong. All humans have prejudice as we are socialized to understand others through our own cultural framework. So for example, I grew up in a community um, in, uh, because of apartheid South Africa, I grew up in a largely Indian community. And there was a very distinct, uh, almost uh, feeling among non the non-Muslim communities against Muslim communities. And so they, they, there'd be these perceptions about Muslims behaved in a certain way and all of that. And so growing up, unfortunately, I grew up right up to my teenage years, I would say, uh, with these prejudices. So I would, uh, and, and at one point I actually caught myself, when I was a teenager in high school, I said something like, not know, having any foundation for this, apart from what I've been heard at home, where I, heard, I said something like, you know how Muslims are. And now that I think about it, no, I don't know how Muslims are. So it comes from stereotypes. It comes from the socialization that we learn at home, that we learn at school and through our communities. So that's prejudice. So we all, as I said, we all have prejudice. Uh, and uh, we all have prejudice, but it's how we choose to address that prejudice or try to educate ourselves uh, to get rid of that prejudice. Uh, discrimination is acting on prejudice. Acts of discrimination can include ignorance, exclusion, threats, ridicule, slander, and violence. And we, I think this is self-explanatory. Racism is prejudice transformed into racism when the dominant racial group prejudice is backed by legal, structural, and institutional control. Therefore, only the dominant racial group who has institutional backing can be racist, which is why reverse racism does not exist. So in most of our countries, uh, whether it's ethnic, whether it's race, um, often there is a dominant group that, um, that, has, uh, that has power, that has the systems in place uh, to ensure that there's different kinds of discrimination and racism. Next slide, please, Cam. So the rest of the definition comes from somebody called, um, he, he has actually done lots of work around anti-racism and he's somebody by the name of Ibrahim Kendi. And the reason why I like his definitions is because it, it really talks about policies and um, and and that's the result. And that 
policies and that's what leads to systemic racism. So he talks about, uh, Kendi talks about racism as a cancer and he himself was a cancer survivor. And he talks about how it's, um, it's something that diseases the entire body and affects the entire body. So racism affects an entire society negatively. And in order to, to, uh, to survive the cancer or get rid of the cancer, you have to go through the hard process of surgery. And, um, and so he was saying, you can't address issues of racism without it having to be a painful discussion. And that's something that we all should remember when we're doing this work as well. Uh, so according to his definition, Racism is the marriage of racist policies and racist ideas that groups produced normalized racial inequalities. Uh, racial inequity is when two or more racial groups are not standing on approximately equal footing. And this, this picture, I think, so, uh, gives us a good idea of equality versus equity. Equality is we may all be on the same footing, but because of different policies, some of us do not have the same accesses to certain things. Whereas equity recognizes that people do not have the same access to certain things. And there's, there's policies put in place to ensure that those people that are marginalized to certain policies are able to, to be on the same footing as the rest of society. So something like uh, affirmative action, which is uh, often looked down upon, especially here in the US, is something that could promote equity if done correctly. Racist policy, any measure that produces or sustains racial inequ inequity between groups. Next slide, please, Camilla. Racial discrimination. It's an immediate and visible manifestation of an underlying racial policy. Again, it's policy. When somebody discriminates against a person in a racial group, they are carrying out a policy or taking advantage of the lack of protective policy. We all have the power to discriminate. Uh, so I'll take an example from, um, from South Africa. Um, and, and because I'm South African, uh, is a few years ago, there were miners that were massacred uh, because they were protesting the working conditions. And it was one of the worst massacres uh, since the new apartheid, uh, since the new government. Um, and people wondered how could a democratic police force um, actually perpetrate these atrocities. And so they were essentially firstly carrying out, uh, carrying out a policy, to, carrying out, uh, they were essentially perpetrating these crimes because there were no uh, policies to protect these workers. And because the culture of apartheid had, had extended that far. Assimilationists, one who is expressing the racist idea that a racial group is culturally or behaviorally inferior and is supporting cultural or behavioral enrichment programs to develop that racial group. We've often heard this in our work. Um, and we've heard that certain communities need development uh, or certain communities need, uh, need to behave in a certain way because they do not form part of society's norms. And it often comes out we've often seen it through the white savior, uh, savior syndrome, where people think that they're actually doing good, but that community has not asked to be changed culturally or their behaviors to be enriched or changed. Uh, and then ethnic racism is a powerful collection of racist policies that lead to inequi inequity between racialized ethnic groups and are substantiated by racist ideas about racialized ethnic groups. Uh, next slide, Cam. So just to say, Kendi has multiple um, definitions, but I chose the ones that are most re relevant to our work. So if anybody wants to go into other definitions uh, about specific groups, you can read up more about his work. 
cultural racists, and these are this could be all of us uh, if we're not careful. One who is creating a cultural standard and imposing a cultural hierarchy among racial groups. So, for example, uh, there's a whole movement now around body shaming and that the perfect body is supposed to be slim and tall and white or light skinned. And that's because it comes from a uh, history of colonialism and still a very white culture. Anti-racists. One who, so the anti-racist is one who is expressing the idea that racial groups are equal and none needs developing and is supporting policy that reduces racial inequity. So I'll read that one more time. One who is expressing the idea that racial groups are equal and that these racial groups do not need developing. And the person is also supporting policy that reduces racial inequity. And then we have colorism, a powerful collection of racist policies that lead to inequities between light and dark people, supported by racist ideas about light and dark people. We've seen this in lots of um, South Asian and African communities where people have started using skin lightening products because there's a certain, again, cultural identity that's promoted within society and where uh, light skin is favored over dark skin. And I should say, as much as I'm sharing lots of this, uh, I think there's a movement, particularly among youth, and we've seen it a lot in social media, where lots of this is, um, is uh, being uh, debated and there's a, a real pushback against it. Anti-racists, again, uh, and, and, and I mentioned that already. Cam, next slide. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see this, uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about allyship and what it means to be an ally. I think often in the space of working in nonprofits, particularly, um, we work in very multicultural groups and multiracial groups. And uh, sometimes we may find ourselves speaking on behalf of other people, almost trying to show the savior syndrome. Uh, and one of the things we should, we should be aware of also in our organizations is the, as especially to, to understand the amount of space that we take up and we've often seen in lots of uh, more and more studies are coming out as well in lots of uh, nonprofit organizations um, it's it's there tends to be and even in conferences there tends to be a space where white folks take up space and so as an ally we need to be very aware of this so um I have the, these resources have come from multiple places. I got lots of it from social media, uh, but I'm just gonna talk a little bit about authentic allyship, performative allyship, white fragility, weaponized white fragility. And we can discuss it more when we uh, go into our group. So authentic allyship, what does that look like? It's allyship where there's empathy, where there's grief, where there's outrage. You're taking risks, holding yourself and others accountable. Your brand is not your concern. So uh, as an NGO, for example, working in this field, it's not about having your name out there and that's the reason why I'm an ally on a certain issue. It could be anything. It could be on race, LGBTQI and issues, gender issues. So you don't care about your brand, you care about the issue. You educate yourself about the issue. You examine your own privilege and how you're using it. You're committed to anti-racist work. And that an anti-racist work, again, is addressing those policies 
and behaviors that are in place that are, uh, that are racist. It's not a means of signaling. It's not about you. So it's not about, I feel that black people should be treated better, or I feel that white people, no, it's not about you. It's about uh, a community that you're working with. And you're allowed to sit with discomfort. You're able to sit with discomfort. So if you're not feeling comfortable, that's okay that you're not feeling comfortable. And that's your role as an ally to sit with that discomfort. Uh, we, had, we had somebody speak at one of our seminars recently, and she talked about allyship as you, as, as particularly within the field of anti-racism, as white people being uh, co-conspirators. Uh, conspirators. So where they actually uh, work with you on developing a plan, but also where they also at the front lines when it's needed. So for example, in the protests in the US, we often saw there were times when white young people, when they knew the police were going to attack the crowds, white young people were standing up front because they knew there was less likelihood of them being attacked. And then we have performative allyship. So this is essentially performing, being an ally. Essentially, you're benefiting from this process, whether it means you're raising funds from it, you're having your name out there. It's bandwagoning. So if there's a new issue, uh, we start suddenly talking about colorism. So all of us are now talking about colorism. So you don't really care about the project, uh, the, the issue. It's something that you're jumping on a bandwagon with everybody else. It's a branding opportunity. You become resentful. Everyone's doing it, so you have to do it. And you're showing receipts of, I. so I was an ally, I did this, so this is what, my organization has received, or this is what I have received. Is everybody clear so far? Can you just tell me in the chat or show me an emoji? Okay, we got a few responses. People are quiet, but okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so white fragility. And this, this is where uh, there's a sense that white people in the anti-racism movement feel, feel fragile and use that in a negative way in an anti-racist movement. So you become defensive, you're afraid, you're uncomfortable, you constantly, constantly police uh, black indigenous and people of color's expression. We've seen this very often in the NGO field. Uh, we've seen it in, in, even in social circles, I've seen it where friends try to police the way you speak or the way you do things uh, because it doesn't fit a white standard. You get offended easily. You're prioritizing your own emotions. So it's about you, you, you. You avoid talking about issues. And there's a sense of guilt. Then within a movement for anti-racism, you can use that white fragility as a weapon to get you to start taking action. But on the other hand, weaponized white fragility is where you use it again in a negative way. So your refusal to look, you use your priv privileges for certain things. You start shaming people, pathologizing black anger. We've heard that often, right? Uh, black people, indigenous community people, people from indigenous communities, people of color, why are they always so angry? Uh, so, that's, that's making it as if it's a, it's a psychological problem when actually it's not. It's a result of years of oppression. There's aggression. Or on the other hand, there's also an insistence on being super nice, which isn't helpful at all because it's not an honest use, it's not an honest reaction. 
and it's not an activating reaction. Next slide, please, Cam. OK, so when we're thinking about allyship and resistance, uh, I thought these were very good quotes that I found online. The one is, victims of oppression and injustice don't need our spasms of passion, but our long obedience in the same direction. So we shouldn't have ebbs of and flows of when we uh, when we're passionate about a certain issue. We need to be have a sustained reaction and a sustained action to to address an issue. And we've seen you've seen this often on like social media. I see friends like if something's happened, if there's if there's uh, for example Palestine, I've seen friends posting nonstop in the past two weeks about this, this in, uh, about the, the violence and the killing of Palestinians. But after that, you don't hear them comment at all about what's happening in Palestine or the need for a sustainable solution. So it happens when everything's in the media, everything's on social media, that's when you get people having these passionate expressions about the injustice. And then the second uh, quote is resistance is not a one, lay, a one lane highway. Maybe your lane is protesting. Maybe your lane is organizing. Maybe your lane is counseling. Maybe your lane is art activism. Maybe your lane is surviving the, the day. Do not feel guilty for occupying every lane. We need all of them. So I said, I, I think I talked about, yes, I did talk about this briefly this morning, but if people were not there, uh, just to repeat, one of the things I often hear from friends or family uh, is, what do we do when something happens? There's this, and I feel like that often myself. I feel the sense of deep impotence, like I'm not sure what to do when, when, when these things happen. Uh, for example, after the George Floyd killing, when all the protests were happening, what do we do? Uh, and this, we don't have to be doing everything all the time. We don't have to be going to protests. We don't have to organize. We don't have to uh, be an activist all the time. We could use the skills and the work that we do for our activism in life and in our work. Okay, next slide, Ash. Uh, sorry, Camilla. Okay, so lastly, there's one more exercise and then we're gonna open up into the group and I'd like to ask you to speak this time. So we all can be allies for different things and different issues. But I think here we're talking particularly about ethnic discrimination and racism. So if you're an ally, uh, you need, you need to use your mouth to speak out against injustice, a nose to sniff out implicit bias, eyes to identify privilege, ears to listen to the Black Indigenous people of color experience, a heart to cultivate empathy for the, empathy for the oppressed, hands to take action. And then I have one closing exercise uh, before we uh, before we close. Um, so I think this is also useful after we, especially after we've done the first the, those early exercises. Is now after we've had a little bit of a discussion towards the end of the session, I'll give you two minutes uh, to say how you feel. Well, so I feel. what you need. So I feel hopeful. I need, you could need anything. You could need water right now. I forgive. I forgive myself for the prejudices that I held in the past. I celebrate. Um, I celebrate it, everything new that I learn every day. I release, um, I release anger. And I trust, 
Um, you can trust your colleagues, you can trust the process, you can trust that we as sites of conscience can all do this together. Okay, so we'll bring that slide up five minutes before we end. But for now, uh, Cam, uh, can you please put in the, the gallery view and close the slides and we'll have a conversation. Uh, so, Naboshka has asked for the slide with definitions of racism. Uh, I think we'll be able to share the slideshow with you all. Uh, will that work for you, Naboshka? Okay, thank you. Thank okay. You. Okay, so any thoughts, any, any questions? Any takeaways from not just today, from the past few days that we've been discussing racism and ethnic discrimination? Yuresh? Yes, Charlie. Um, can you touch on intersectionality? Yes. So the one thing that, um, so there's multiple, I think I talked a little bit about this earlier today uh, and some of you were there, is that there's different, there's different types of isms. So we have racism, classism, sexism, um, and, and able, ableism that all intersect. And so when you have multiple intersections, there's multiple oppressions. So for example, one of the things that you could do when you are working with a community is look at the, the, the different types of oppressions and which areas you need to, to address. So for example, um, if you're looking at black women uh, who are, they black, they women, so they oppressed on those two levels. Uh, a queer woman, so she's further marginalized because she's a queer woman, and she's uh, and she's not an able-bodied woman. So she's um, she has some kind of disability. That will be multiple inter, uh, That will be an intersection of multiple uh, oppressions, and so she would need a different type of treatment. Uh, and working with her in a different way. Uh, you would take a white woman. Uh, she's white, so she has privilege, but she's a woman, so she's been oppressed. Um, she, is, um, she is heterosexual, so she doesn't have any oppression on that level, but she also has um, some kind of, she, uh, she's not able-bodied in some way. So there's two levels of uh, oppression on that level. Uh, so we could do that with every individual and every group that we work with. Uh, and we need to map and be very cognizant of those intersectionalities. There's also classism, right? So if you take my example uh, of the white woman, uh, she could be of a lower class. So that's another oppression. Uh, whereas if somebody, and, and then if, if the black woman I mentioned is Middle class, that's not necessarily an oppression. So that's uh, a positive in her, in her map, in the mapping of her life. Uh, does, that, uh, does that answer your question, Shirley? Uh, yeah, I do, uh, it does. Um, there was an interesting conversation in the chat group about this. So uh, I, I thought it would be good just to talk about it, especially around classism. Okay, I'll look at the chat, but in the meantime, I think Marta had comments uh, and questions. Uh, yeah, JJ, would I'll you translate. Have... So to identify discriminations, it is necessary to ask ourselves, which persons, groups of people are included and which are not? In which base is this distinction, gender, age, rank, position, economic position, etc., is being uh, established? What is the distinction? Uh, is, does this distinction or discrimination respond to a, a need, needed situation? Is it reasonable? 
or does it respond uh, relate to a uh, does it relate to a legitimate uh, division or differentiation between people? In which contexts activities uh, is it inserted or excluded? Uh, in which capacities is it recognized? Uh, to which is it, is it associated? The problems, the diseases, the the bentahas. I'm not sure. And uh, and which contributions? Advantages. Which was uh, is it? Are, which was is it given for the so that these groups can speak uh, their own views? Uh, I'm not sure. Am I supposed to answer that or <laughs> was no, it just Martha, thoughts? I think Marta was uh, was was putting her thoughts, but Marta, you can you can jump in and speak for yourself. <laughs> Sí, no, pero no, no es para que sea... Yes, and it wasn't, it wasn't for, for anyone to answer, actually. It was simply because I find that everyone at some point discriminates. We all do. A moment ago, someone said, you know, maybe I, I don't realize it when I discriminate. So I just find that these are questions that we should ask ourselves simply to properly determine if we are in a discriminatory situation or not. That was it. Thanks, Marta. And then Gustavo had something to say. He's just saying he must uh, leave. He's got another meeting, but thank you for all the contributions. He says, interesting and very hopeful. Okay, great. Uh, Shelly, I'm looking at the middle class uh, discussion and um, it was what's the difference between working class and middle class? Uh, some uh, Nizia conferences. Who's that? Uh, it's Mitzi. It's Mitzi. Oh, Mitzi. She <laughs> says, I use middle class as above poverty. Uh, Nabushka said, it depends on the problem of middle class and how it's defined by a set of parameters that fluctuate almost on a daily basis. This is why historically it was frequently the main social base for a variety of salvation of the nation ideologies, including fascism and the cause of racism. Okay, uh, so, and Shirley, is that not classism? Um, I think, um, so, I, I mean, I, and this, I think that the whole discussion around classism and racism is a very complex question but also I think we should be very, and, and, and lots of it will view it from the paradigm from which we come. So for example, we would have Marxists in the group or we would have anti-fascists in the group. So you, it, it's from the paradigm that you come from that you would identify it. But I think that we also need to be very careful that we do not conflate classism and racism. And sometimes it is racism and it's often reduced to classism so we don't have to deal with it on that level of racism so that's something that that constantly comes up and it's constantly mediated but um i think it's something to also be aware of i think somebody also else had a question rosario Ereshek, I would also just like to make a comment and on what you just said uh i think it's super important the idea of not conflating because they are they are um very complex topics, but also because by conflating, we take the focus out of the issue of racism, which is so complicated. And I think we just, you know, we can discuss all different things, but sitting with racism is difficult. And I think it's also an exercise to sit with this discomfort of the, of this discussion. So let me just see. Uh, okay, let me translate Chado. So uh, link to what uh, I think it's to what Marta said that she refers here. It would be good, or, or maybe to what Shirley said, it would be good to uh, talk about the naturalization of, of racism uh, that leads us to not recognize our action, our own discriminatory actions, uh, and worse, uh, of even not recognizing them when, it's, uh, when they are entrenched in state policies. I agree, Rosario. Anybody has any comments on what Rosario said? The, 
The reality is that racism is so normalized often and discrimination. Um, so even even like prejudice, as I'm saying, like I was, so I'll give you an example. I was talking to a, a friend recently who's supposed to be a friend who's very aware of racial issues. And the friend, we are talking about this neighborhood. And I said, uh, I'm not sure if this neighborhood is diverse. And the friend said, and, and diverse meaning that it's multiracial. That's, that's the language that's used here in the US. And the friend said, oh, it's definitely multiracial. Did you see the crime rates? But not even thinking about what they said. So it's always there. The prejudice, the stereotypes are always there. And I think we just need to be aware of it. Uh, I think Mitzi had a hand up. Is Mitzi still here? Yes, Mitzi. Yes, um, I think the middle class discussion started when I posted uh, what, when one of your answers on how do you, how did it make you feel when you were in a position of power? And my answer was, I cannot relate <laughs> because I am a woman. In the Philippines, I'm a woman and middle class, meaning working and above poverty and and I'm also in, in multilateral platforms, uh, like at UN meetings, I'm Asian. So these are, <laughs> you know, it, it, that's uh, uh, all, all of these three put together has not put me in a position of power. So I cannot relate to that question. So that's how the middle class <laughs> discussion uh, came about. Um, maybe just the context as well, because in Asia, it's not just you're being discriminated as a woman. There's also levels of discrimination among women, where because of um, uh, colonialism and the the impact it had in our society, there's also the that divide in social. You know, and there's also that privilege of women in social higher socioeconomic status has more privilege than women in lower socioeconomic status. Whether you're all working, but uh, that, that, uh, that, well, it's capitalism is pretty much linked to racism here in our region. So if you cannot remove that from the kind of discrimination and racism discussions that's out there in our region. So that's I just wanted to uh, clarify that. <laughs> Thanks, Mitzi. Uh, Danny, you had something. Do you want to uh, unmute yourself and speak? Danny? Mr. Ziwani, that's you. Oh, uh, Danny says he can't mute his, unmute his mic. Let me try to find. Sometimes he's got uh, internet issues. Let me try to unmute you, Daniel, just a second. I can't unmute you for some reason. Kami, can you unmute him? Ah, you can speak now, Danny. Dan, go ahead. Mm, I don't think that we can hear him. Okay, Not let, 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 me, let me read it then. I think that the comment supports the sentiment that racism elevates or demotes and thus classify, be it education-wise, economically, or and or club memberships. Thanks, Danny. Anybody else? Can I have a short uh, a comment about conflation? Yes, never. Sure. Well, uh, my basic uh, um, uh, like um, impression uh, 
till the first uh, presentation this morning was that it is not clear like taking uh, this, the, this naive uh, uh, metaphor of society as a body, let's say, I was not clear. Do, do we see uh, racism as infection in the body of capitalist society or as some of its tissues? I think that from most of the presentations, we can see from this uh, term like embedded, uh, uh, constantly present, perpetuating, that it is some sort of a tissue in capitalist society, not always the same, uh, the same tissue, and, uh, not always equally important, but it is there. And that if we treat it as some infection, like uh, foreign to the tissue, then this is one frame. I think that it is not good enough frame. It is not just Marxist or anti-fascist. There is very serious theory about class society reproducing this like prejudice in, in class society serves to protect to protect interest mostly class interest if we didn't have prejudice about the roma people we would we would get depressed when we see them uh, what they, they are uh, uh, pressed to do in our society but we since we have prejudice we like see what they do and we go away and we forget it in one minute so this prejudice is socially constructed like personal uh, uh, of course that personal we can be against it but like uh, uh, claiming that we don't have them is like for me problematic thing you know so i think that this is not conflation that it is built in the uh, uh, the, the problems of society and that of course there are variety of measures and approaches that help clarify its own position importance and dangers which are very specific especially in societies that are uh, based on on uh, uh, history that we commented in many of presentations, but like to put out the the question of society that has it as sometimes it's just a small part of tissue, but sometimes as a backbone, like in South Africa or in uh, southern states before. Uh, it's like it doesn't. It's not helpful. It's not productive on the long run. In urgent instances, of course we focus on a certain problem but like on a big conference big seminar we should have more insight into these structural problems if it is systemic if it is uh, strange to the system then it is not systemic it is some infection of the system thank you uh i'm gonna open up anybody has any any uh comments on that but uh, just before just to clear i i agree with you nabosha but i'm at the so the author that i quoted he he was basically he he was saying that it it is he it's so systemic it's like a cancer so it's so embedded in the entire body and uh and that was his analogy and he was talking about the u.s specifically and he was talking about how people in the u.s want to address the issue of racism, systemic racism, without going through the pain of it. And he was saying, if you're going to do it, you need to understand that it's it's like a cancer, you need to deal with the pain for you to come out on the other side. So, but I saw Shirley nodding vigorously. <laughs> Shirley, any comments? No, I think, I think that um, it's been quite enriching hearing uh, uh, points of view from different parts of the world, Asia and Serbia. Uh, so um, I, I, I think we should, there are quite a lot of people here, maybe hear another, another point of concern or interest. Any other thoughts, concerns? Uh, Abdullah. As uh, uh, salamu alaykum jamiaan. Wa... Hello, everyone. I would like to add something that has uh, not been mentioned in this um, session today about racism and about discrimination, racial discrimination. I believe that all the societies experience bullying and discrimination in one way or another. But the worst kinds of racism are the ones that are done on purpose. 
uh, when there are programs to practice and exercise these uh, ex uh, these um, uh, discrimination policies, as um, happened in South Africa and in uh, what is happening in Palestine and and East Asia, these programs are more painful because we know that they are well planned, and uh, there is. There is a determined and resolute intention to uh, practice this discrimination or these discrimination policies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think, yeah, it's more, uh, it, it's, it's more offensive and it's more difficult to address when it's so deeply entrenched through policy as well as practice. Uh, I wanted to share with you, I, I, I just on that note, something that um, I also found online that I thought, and you could, we'll find a way, I, I think if you Google it as a tree of justice, um, if you Google it as a tree of justice, you will, uh, you'll find it online. But I thought this was a very useful example to describe uh, uh, different types of uh, justice, equality, and equity. I'm going to try and share my uh, screen. Okay, so this, this, this is the diagram. Uh, and it describes inequality as unequal access to opportunities. And so one person has it, the other person doesn't. I mean, inequality. Then it de describes equality as evenly distributed tools and assistance. So this person now has the ladder, but is still unable to reach. And then equity, where the person has custom tools that identify and address the inequality. So you will see this ladder is slightly higher than this ladder so that this child can reach the apples. And then justice is fixing the systems to offer equal access to both tools and opportunities. So I just wanted to share that with you all. Uh, yes, JJ. Um, I'd just like to say I love that example because for me it brings that to the notion that to achieve that for the fully just system, some need to rel relinquish power in favor of others. We need to distribute power. And for that to happen, we need to be able to, those in positions of privilege, need to be able to deal, analyze, understand their privilege, and, and share. And that goes back to your first question, sharing power. So that brings me to the question that it's super important that we, uh, when we, when we deal with the pain, as you as you notice, that we deal equally with the notions of whiteness and the pain of of of, of being white and and the guilt and what it means and what it carries and your privilege or any other privilege you don't need to be white you can be coming from a position of privilege and you may be contributing towards the inequalities and the inequities that we see so you know the exercise needs to be done equally on both sides if you are to be a true ally and it's the hardship and the painful exercise that has to be equal for everybody and those that you know, carry maybe are sitting on the side of not necessarily you inflicted the pain, but you've been carrying the line of those who inflicted the pain. Need to sit with that and understand how to contribute and say sorry and 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 how what role you're going to play in this equitable world to be equitable. Yeah, totally agree, JJ. Uh, it's about identifying and being able to sit with this discomfort and relinquish power when needed. The other thing that we haven't raised, and I don't know if it's been raised in other sessions, um, uh, is the question of, and I'm more and more interested in this because there's so many people that fall into this category, is we either talk about things in terms of victims and perpetrators, uh, but 
what about the bystanders? What about the people that are, that are like, as JJ said, like we have people who come down the line, for example, of slave owners, but we get the argument in the US, uh, my family didn't own slaves, so, but you benefited. So it's the beneficiaries as of the system, as well as the, um, as well as the bystanders. And how do we work with them or how do we try to get them to address questions of, to become anti-racist essentially? I'm not sure if anybody has any thoughts on that. Okay, so if nobody has any thoughts, I'm just gonna go through my next screen. Uh, I'm gonna ask Camilla to uh, put up the last uh, slide. And then I'm gonna ask each of you in the chat box uh, to just identify the part of the body that you're gonna use for your anti-racist work. And you can start in the chat box right now before we end. Mind. Thanks, Shirley, all the others, hands. Hand. Come on, guys, I want to just see you all rolling with it, everybody. <laughs> Mouth and ears. Marta said, Manus. Manus is mouth, right, JJ? Manos. Manos is hands. Hands, oh, sorry. Heart and hands. Mouth and ears. Anybody else? Mouth and mind. Nose. The whole lot. Okay, so. I hope this session got you thinking a little bit more about your own position in the discussion around race and anti-racism about your organization. And I hope it's given you some tools as well. Um, and I hope we continue, we keep on keeping on. Uh, thank you all for your participation. And I know it's it's a difficult discussion to have. So thank you for participating. I'm gonna hand over to JJ uh, to close. Thank you, Iresh. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody, everybody for, for coming again uh, to our third day. It's a long workshop. Um, thank you for being with us for this long.